Welcome into episode 198. Be sure you're following us on Twitter at Bailey J. Adams 22, at by CA Simmons, at Night Sports Now, and at Pegasus Podcast. Christian, how are we on this? What, oh, it's Wednesday. I thought I was going to say Thursday. Wednesday, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. Um, We've talked about in the past how I don't do it nearly as much as I used to. I used to always try to, I'm the one who presses record when we do the podcast. I often would try to make you laugh, like say something really stupid right beforehand. And for some reason this week, I, I don't even remember what I just said, but I made my, you were fine and I made myself laugh and I couldn't, you I said, couldn't stop you, laughing. <laughs> you said, instead of pressing, you said, I'm going to smash that like button. That's right. Which and is not funny in any way, shape or form. But no, I don't know. Reason. And then I, I don't know why, but I thought of some of the things that you said in the past that have made me chuckle and like, I have to just like cut it off my laugh. And that made me smile too. You've almost got me a couple times lately. I don't want you to keep trying, but you've almost gotten me a couple of times and I've like started the podcast. People probably see, like if you go back to different podcasts, you'll see why, like if I'm smirking at the beginning, it's not just cause I'm like happy to be podcasting. It's just, I'm probably trying to suppress a laugh at something Christian said before he hit the buttons. Cause I'm a mean person and the type of person who attempts to derail their own podcast when it starts. <laughs> I don't know why. Just, just because it's my part, it. my, cause I do the intro. It's like, I just think it's funny. Yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it started when we'd like just start the podcast and like weren't very big or anything. And I felt there were no stakes and, and now I just keep <laughs> doing it. So it's fun. Yeah. Why not? Um, yeah. we got a couple things to get through today. We're going to talk um, about KJ Jefferson, UCS quarterback. And we've talked last week about how there's no intrigue anymore about <laughs> UCS quarterback position um, now that John Rice Plumlee has gone, but um, we're going to talk about KJ Jefferson and where he might rank after this season among all time UCF quarterbacks. I know, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but it'll be interesting to kind of talk about where in one year he could, you know, find himself depending on how the season goes. Then we'll finish up with some spring ball updates, of course, as that continues after spring break. Not ended. like, but, the, not like there are a lot, but we will talk no, about the few no, things there are. No, of course not. Um, and yeah, we'll get into maybe how <laughs> boring this period of spring ball has been so far, but just kind of how both of us have kind of been like, I don't know, there's nothing really going on. So um, we'll start though with KJ Jefferson and, you know, he's UCS qu quarterback and we've you know mentioned it. He's going into the season. There's no question about, you know, who's going to be the starter or what's this going to look like because he's, I would say a finished product. I don't think he's necessarily going to take like a giant leap I and mean, he might look a little different depending on, you know, how at home he is in the system and everything. But UCF has, you know, a quarterback, they kind of know what they're going to get from him and, it is only going to be one year, but where could like the type of season that he's going to put together, where could he end up ranking all time? Like, will he be limited by just having one year? Cause he can only be so, so high, right. Unless he has like an all time great season, I guess. It's actually and they go to the very, playoff or something. It's very odd to think about UCF's quarterback history. Right. And I was thinking yeah. about this a lot in context for this episode, because it's such an interesting, interesting topic to me because the fan base, unless I'm misreading, it seems beyond all in on KJ Jefferson. This is the most all in they've been on a quarterback in a while. And with good reason, he's very good. But mm -hmm. you look at UCF's full quarterback history and it's, it's basically like either complete and total superstar or like, completely average and that's kind of been it the entire way and i find that very interesting because i think he's probably going to be in the middle of those two things yeah there are a few like random stragglers like I mean, obviously everybody knows like the elite tier is like dante blake bortles and uh, mckenzie milton and you have then, to put gabriel in there like i, I know that yeah. he didn't win anything here but he's still in there and that's where it gets kind of interesting because it's like he's up there because of the stats and all that but he did never win anything. I can't really think of what his signature win would have been. We've talked about that on the pod. Before. Uh, like, he was literally the was... 2019 Gasparillable MVP. So <laughs> we've talked about it too. Like, was that his signature win or was it Boise State in 2021, like two weeks before his final UCF game? Like, I don't know. But there is that, like, kind of tier. And there's kind of like guys who, you know, won conference championships, like Justin Holman, you know, Daryl Mack won a conference championship and one of his, what, three starts at UCF. Um, so where in like where in that can he fall? It probably will be somewhere in the middle unless he does something crazy like he has, you know, he sets a record for or he gets up there in like top two or three for single season touchdowns or something like that. Or if they go to the play, like if team success could have a lot to do with it. Like, and I think his success will correlate to the team success. Like if he has a huge season, they might find themselves in the mix for a conference title. And if he's the quarterback who gets UCF to their first Big Twelve title game, then he's going to be held up in that high regard to some of the best in history. Yeah, it's going to depend on the season. Because you're right, what you just said is that if they're, I feel like he could be a pretty average quarterback. And if they go, if they win the Big 12 championship, he's going to be remembered as, ah, the KJ Jefferson. Yeah. That's just how <laughs> football goes. But 
we when we talked about this idea initially about talking about where his legacy might stand, it, it, it's interesting because originally I think I even said to you, I was like, it's going to be tough in one year for him to establish anything. I'm kind of rethinking that because Mackenzie Milton is the greatest player in program history, in my opinion, except for sometimes when I say it's Dante and I've said it's Bortles a few times. I don't really have a set <laughs> opinion on this, but for this discussion, we'll say he is. Mm -hmm. Um he really didn't do anything in 2016 as a true freshman. Then 2017 happened. That was a single season and he was a God on campus and everything else. And sure he backed it up in 2018, but if Milton had for whatever reason, never played after 2017, he still would have had that legacy. So yeah. I, I think that KJ absolutely can do it in one season. I'm getting a little concerned and I am fully aware of the facts that I am helping feed this as are many others, but I feel like we're mythologizing KJ a little bit before he's ever actually played for UCF because I don't think he's, as good as some of the fan base is starting to act I'm like I'm glad you're saying that. Because I had I was in preparation for this, had pulled up his stats at Arkansas and was like, what is his ceiling really? Like, is right. is he going to be he's, he's not going to be a four thousand yard passer? This is why she's gonna do it now, but he's not gonna be a four thousand yard passer who throws for 35 or 40 touchdowns and then runs for a thousand yards. Like I don't think he has that kind of season this year. Like his best season, what was probably 2021 2022 2021 was 2676 passing yards 21 touchdowns and four interceptions and then he ran for 664 yards and six more touchdowns so like right. that's a really good season but as far as like all-time great season is he capable of doing that maybe he is in this offense I don't know we'll see what the offense looks like but I don't know that he's going to go out and top 3,000 yards even as a passer and then I don't know if he throws for 3000 yards and runs for a thousand, like, yeah, I think that's going to be like one of the, the more impressive seasons we've seen from a UCF quarterback, but I just kind of am curious about what his ceiling really is. And it could be like, he doesn't need to be a superstar for this team to be you know good and considered a, a competitor in the big 12. I don't think, but I think people are kind of billing him as a superstar. And I think the be and that's and and let me be clear that's UCF fans doing that like nationally yeah, yeah. I think it's telling that UCF fans are continually surprised when there's like a top five quarterbacks for 2024 list and he's not on it and people are getting mad and I'm got I'm kind of like guys he's he's perfect for Malzahn's offense and I think they're going to be really good with him he's not that level like this, this I, isn't a guy going say, in the first round of the NFL draft next year I will say two on that though there has been some national buzz I think we talked about yeah. that a few weeks ago like ESPN wrote a story about like you know KJ Jefferson you know as you, and it's more than I think we've seen in past years. And I think part of that might just be UCF being in the big 12 and there being, you know, more around that, which kind of goes in the face of what we we're talking about last week and, and their, you know, what they are nationally, but we've seen some of that, but it's, I think, yeah, a lot of it is UCF fans being like, Oh, he's Cam Newton. Like, yeah. No which, one, no one is Cam Newton, but to be fair, like I understand, well, Cam Newton's Cam Newton, but, um, yeah, and so is Dylan Gabriel. If, if you're to believe that one Gus Malzahn press conference from spring of 2021 or no, that was in fall when Gabriel had the, do you remember this? It was when Gabriel had that Not really, really. Cool cool run against Boise state in the 2021 game. And then, and Gus compared him to Cam Newton after the game, which was the weirdest. That was one of my first like signs that sometimes Gus just says things in press conferences, yeah. but I do remember that. I hope I'm not misremembering that. If that's wrong, I apologize for slandering Malzahn, but I, I very specifically remember him comparing. He said something along the lines of, I haven't seen anything like that since I coached Cam Newton or something like that. And I was that's like, that's insane. Okay. That is an insane um, statement. But I, I and when I say that he KJ is not a superstar, by the way, we're we're going for audience retention that two weeks in a row we've we've done UCF's brand has fallen off and KJ isn't as good as you think. Like what <laughs> what a great two weeks. And we did a basketball pod the week before that. Yeah. So we're crushing it right now. But I think it's very realistic that we will be talking about KJ at the end of the 2024 season as UCF had a top 20 quarterback in college football. Like I think that's his ceiling and his level. Yeah. I don't think he's one of these elite. I don't think he's going to be in New York or getting high yes. votes the way Milton was or things like that. And I just think it's important to understand that. I do think that the reason there's so much room for him to have a legacy with UCF is A, we're coming off of three years at this point of, of mid-tier to low-tier quarterback play. And I think UCF fans are starved for a quarterback who is just really effective. And for everything we just said, he is the type of quarterback that was put on earth to run a Malzahn offense. And as much as I've said about Malzahn, my worries with him calling plays and those worries still stand. It is like that pairing with KJ is, is presumably mm -hmm. going to be pretty powerful. And I kind of wonder, and there's, there's room for that too, where you get to the end of this season and maybe UCF, I don't know, maybe they did go eight and four and like, that yeah, was a pretty good season, but you know, compared to what everyone was kind of talking about beforehand, they didn't live up to what they wanted to, but you also kind of remember like, if he has a fun, if he's a fun guy to watch because of his style of play, 
Right. There are going to be some, I think, memorable moments that he gives UCF fans. They'd be like, that was a fun quarterback to watch. John Rice Pumley was a flat out ineffective quarterback in 2022. And because of his highlight reel style of play, a lot of the fan base liked him a lot. And yeah. So, yeah, I think there's merit to that. Did you know, by the way, that UCF has not had a quarterback throw for 20, just 20 touchdowns in a single season since 2020? That doesn't surprise me. No, it's, you say that. It doesn't I it doesn't surprise me either, but it's just especially coming off of Gabriel and Milton back to back and and <laughs> Milton himself being just two years removed mm-hmm. from Bortles. It's like that's a weird drop off to realize that not even 20. Mikey Keene had 17 in 2021. Uh John Rice Plumley, I believe, had 14 in 2022, and then I think he had 15 in 2023. And I know injuries played a role in that. I'm not saying it is. but it's still just odd to think about. I guess you kind of forget a little bit how much he was injured in 2023. Cause like I we said 15, I was like, I would have thought he was like way closer to 20 than 15 touchdowns the whole season. I mean, obviously he had how many rushing did he have? Do you have that up or no? Uh, I, I can don't... if you talk for about five seconds. I it's just it is kind of bizarre to me. Like I just I would have thought twenty twenty three because he did he was when he was healthy he was a lot better than he was in twenty twenty two. I'd say he and had I five thought, rushing like... touchdowns in twenty twenty three. Okay, which I also yeah, want to say think... he was hurt for a chunk of the season. He still played in ten games. It's not yeah. like he missed half the year or something. It's just and and partially and this is what'll be interesting with KJ. It's also just what the the talent UCF has and the 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 positions they're strong at, and also just how Malzahn likes his offenses. Like even at Auburn, like other than like Cam Newton, it wasn't common mm-hmm. for quarterbacks to just blow up and have these crazy numbers. It was more common for like running backs to be putting up seasons that you're right. talking about. And honestly, with R.J. Harvey, it's you're probably going to see that to an extent in this year. But I mean, KJ, you look at I mean, he clearly has a high ceiling because in 2022, which was his strongest year, he completed 68 percent of his passes through for. 2,636 yards and 24 touchdowns, just five interceptions. He picked up 640 rushing yards and nine touchdowns on the ground as well. Then even in 2023, which is the year where he was hurt for part of it, and they had all the issues with the new offensive coordinator who didn't understand how to use him, and that's part of the reason (laughs) he left, still completed 64% of his passes for 2,100 yards, 19 touchdowns to eight interceptions, 447 rushing yards and two touchdowns on the ground was a little banged up too wasn't he he, was banged up for a good chunk of the year and still and he still went to Gainesville and beat Florida in 2023 like I'm saying like his his down year where he had an OC who didn't know how to use him and was also banged up is still better than any UCF quarterback has done since 2020 yeah and 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 that's in the SEC which this is like I cover your ears UCF fans but this is going to be a step down in competition for him coming to the big 12 not a giant step down but a step down and I think that's what's exciting about him is like, yeah, he doesn't have, I wouldn't say the gaudy numbers of like a Heisman candidate. And I don't know, you know, maybe he does go out and do that. But even if he doesn't, UCF can be really, really good because put just copy and paste that 2022 season. That's 33 total touchdowns and he only threw five picks. Yeah. And like even the year before that, he only threw four picks. Like he's very the, efficient. There's not a lot of, right. there's not a lot of costly or careless turnovers, which I think is what yeah. UCF fans have become super accustomed to the last two seasons. <laughs> And I think this past season, even like 19 touchdowns through the air, eight interceptions, like it was up a little bit. But again, it was there were some mitigating factors there with the OC, who I think was fired like midseason. That, that is coaching in, malpractice right? that you're running an offense with a quarterback like KJ and you somehow only let him have two rushing touchdowns in a season. How does that yeah. happen? Yeah, it's and he goes down from four and a half and four and point one yards per carry to two point eight. Like, I don't know. I don't know what they were trying to coach into him, but you have to let KJ be KJ, I think. And I think Gus is going to do that. Gus is going to let KJ be KJ. That's why I think it's like he could have that kind of season where he, yeah, maybe throws for 25, 2,600 yards, does top 20 touchdowns. (laughs) He's the first one to do that in a few years for UCF. And he runs for another seven, eight, whatever, how many touchdowns. And that's a really, really solid season. And doing all of that while not turning the ball over a ton is going to have your offense in a really good spot. Now we'll see what the right. UCF defense does, but if the defense is able to hold up their end of it, you're talking about UCF as a contender, you know, deep into the season, like we're hoping. And I don't know. I, I keep like, I keep wanting to say like, yeah, it would be so great if they, if they went to like the big 12 title game and they, you know, won the big 12 title. I'm having a harder time picturing it. I don't know if it's just because I don't know why that is. I, I guess it's just because it's still, it's still relatively new to UCF being in this conference and it would be kind of crazy to see them in their second year go play for and or win the title. But like it, it's, and we talked about it last week, there's how many eight or eight or nine big 12 teams that probably feel like that they can do that this year. And UCF's that exactly there is why I'm scared because I really want that to happen. I think that's what the fan base, I, I'm not ready to say the fan base expects that this year, but I right. think that's absolutely the goal this year. And it, what yeah. scares me is, the sheer volume of teams in this conference who believe this is their year. And it's just that feeling of something's got to give. And it's not even like in the AAC when you'd go into a season and say, yeah, UCF 
really thinks they can win the AAC this year. Cincinnati thinks the same thing and Memphis does. So you're kind of like, oh yeah, one of, one of them's one of them's going to get left out. This is like, there are going to be like five plus teams who, that so was it's not, it's, this it's, year. yeah. So it's not even like UCF is either like, oh, conference style, I just missed. It's like, they might go eight and four. They might go seven and five. And it's like, and that's the part that scares me is it's just the, the it, I guess it's the out of your hands thing. Like mm-hmm. UCF and the AAC, especially the second half of their time in the AAC, when they were at their peak under Frost and Heupel, it, it, it just, you basically played the schedule and there were three games you really had to talk about. And the rest of it was just gravy. And I know that that wasn't mm-hmm. always true. Like they drop a Tulsa game in 2019 or whatever, but it just felt like if they took care of business, they'd be there. That's not true mm-hmm. in the big 12. It's not that simple. You have to have a, some luck on your side because it's just that competitive and that tough. And there's no gimme games. Yeah. There's no, the athletic just did this whole podcast there until Saturday feed on the big 12. And they were talking about how oh, echoing a lot of the stuff that we've said, which validated me and made me feel smart about how it's just, a scary conference because yeah, there's no superpower. There's no like Alabama or Oklahoma or anything like that anymore, but there's also literally no floor. There's no Vanderbilt. There's no Syracuse. There's no Oregon state or Cal or like there's, there's no one ever down in this conference. It's everyone's just good. I'm trying to think of a good comparison. Like there's no Alabama. There's no, no, like none of those teams, but I'm trying to think is like, I have a comparison for you. I would say, I was going to say like, there's like nine of one team. Like I can't think of like what that team would be. I'm going to tell you, well, I'll tell you my comparison is that it's the NFL. (laughs) It's no one, like everyone's just kind of similar. Like there aren't like giant, um, but like what? Yeah, I don't know. It's just one team you can pick. Like nine LSUs who can like be, be really good. But I don't know. I feel like LSU has a little bit more. Yeah. LSU is more of a blue blood. I I, I literally pick it. It's like, it's like 16 TCUs. (laughs) It's just, it's a lot of teams that in a given year can be incredibly good or maybe okay. And, and like I said, it's really a resource thing more than anything is it's just, I know I sound like a broken record, but and it's part of the reason the ACC is facing collapse. And it's part of the reason the Pac-12 collapsed is most conferences have layers of investment and support from different programs. Like Boston College and Syracuse have different goals as an athletic program than Clemson and Florida State do. And you go to the you go to the Big Ten, Ohio State's athletic program operates very differently from Iowa's or from Northwestern's. And Northwestern's is even different from Iowa's. I mean, there's literally tiers and they all have different levels of investment, fan support and success. The Big 12 is just 16 teams who are the same. Like they all yeah. have same investment, same expectations, same fan support, all very, very, very similar. So it just, it, it, it means that there's no predicting like uh, UCF can do everything right. And KJ can be awesome. And they still mm-hmm. just might not get there because it's, it's just out of your hands to an extent. Yeah. And I think I had a thing to say that it was like going to risk taking us like further off the rails, but then I thought of something that we can get us back on, on track. So I'm going to take us off the rails a little bit. And it's back to what you said about and when they said this about the schedule when it came out, it was like, it, there's no longer that like, oh yeah, there's a gimme game there. There's a gimme game there. Like you look at the schedule and you're like, most of the games in conference, you can say, yeah, I could see them winning and or like, I can see them winning yeah. or losing that game. And that's like where it gets scary because you can play really well and you could still lose the game on some weird thing. We've seen a lot of crazy big 12 endings over the years. Yeah. And that's going to continue and get yeah, wilder because the conference has gotten even weirder this year. They're adding in these Pac-12 schools yeah. who also are all the same. It's it's very odd. But well, if you just think about it, like UCF blew what was it? A, what was the lead against Baylor? I don't even thirty-five remember anymore. to seven. Thirty-five to seven, and then Colorado did that the next week. Yeah, like and then now like now Colorado's in that in the conference too. It's like there's just some sort of like insanity factor for like every one of these teams in it's this also just and... look at ucf they blew a 35 to 7 lead and lost to a baylor team that went three and nine and they beat an oklahoma state team that finished in the top 25 won 10 games went to the big 12 title 45 to 3 like a yeah. month apart <laughs> it's, just, no, it's 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 just it's like that but it's ridiculous to get us and back get... on track a little bit okay. unless you have something else to say well i was gonna get i had something to talk about too that's actually back on track the we'll KJ go for topic. it we'll go with you, you talk about it no it's I don't know. All right, we'll see, because this could take us off the rails again. But I'm wondering, this is off the rails, but also still talking about quarterbacks. At the end of this year, are we looking at K.J. Jefferson on a completely different tier than we're looking at John Rice Plumley? And, and at the same time, is John Rice Plumley's legacy, if you want to call it that, or whatever you want to call it, like his, his status at UCF so toxic because of just everything surrounding those two years like is it just a toxic legacy where like no one's ever going to agree on what his legacy actually was i think you can come at it from like a level-headed point of view i think we could do that you you know i don't know that everyone does as a wider fan base is legacy is one of those things that gets decided sort of in the years after like i don't think we can really talk about john russ plumley's legacy right now because we'll have to see 
JRPs and how we're going to look at him is kind of tied to what Gus does next, because if Gus just keeps bringing in different quarterbacks and slightly underperforming, which has basically been the theme with him, then it's that's going to become its own thing. But if say that they're awesome with KJ, like they win the Big 12 or not, I'm not even saying that high. Say they say they go nine and three, they win a bowl, they're 10 and three, finish in like ranked number 16 or something. Then next year they switch to EJ Colson, whoever, and they're just good. Then it's going to be looked back on like, yeah, he Gus screwed up that quarterback situation. JRP just wasn't mm-hmm. the right guy. Now, if it just continues that every year is high expectations don't really hit, then it I don't know. JRP just feels like different in that mindset, you know? So much of it does just depend on how the year goes. Because like, I think years from now, and, and I, we'll see, but I think years from now, I, we will look back at JRP as like both yeah, they probably underperformed in, in those years, but also like he was a fun guy to watch. Like I think yeah. it will become more of that was him. Like, oh yeah, he, he was a highlight reel. Like look at how much how much fun he was. And you kind of forget or push to the side like some of the more negative aspects of him. And there's a chance for at the same time if this this year, if it's a more frustrating year than everyone expects or hopes it's going to be, I think even as you get years away from it, you'll be like KJ was really awesome. He's like really fun yeah. to watch too. And they could be realized. on the same tier in that in that kind of same in that same sense. You just said something that made me realize that JRP is going to have a way stronger legacy than his actual performance was, because you're right. We're going to be sitting here. It's going to be 2031 and we'll be on whatever social media app is big then. I don't know. Maybe it'll be chips in our heads. Who can tell? And someone randomly, some random fan account is going to go, man, John Ross Plumlee was nasty with like a two minute highlight video. And everyone's going to go like, dang, like he was awesome. Like, oh, how did they only go six and seven with him or whatever? Like, I I just can see that happening, you know, because it's like his highlights are so awesome. Fans just going to be like, wow, like that's so cool. And just sort of admit or forget the stats and and how things actually went, you know. It's funny that we're saying that because. That's already happened, I think. Yeah. Like, I think UCF posted his highlights, like, last week or something like that. And I don't I don't know. I, I could probably pull it up and find the comments, and a lot of it would probably just be, you know, praise for how he's going to tear up the NFL and stuff like that. Like, I just... But you know what? I It was like a 10-minute video they posted. It was basically like, here's every good play of John Rice, John Rice Plumlee's UCF career. And I watched it, and I'm like, if you showed me this in, like, 2019 and just told me, here's their next Milton, I'd be like, wow, he looks even better than Milton. It's just that... In well, between all the amazing yeah. things, he would do the most insanely bad things you've ever seen. And it's, it's he was the most made for a highlight reel player ever. And that's why I think highlight reels have to be taken as nothing more than just fun. Like yeah. highlight reels are for fun, not for determining what a player is or was like, because that's that's how people will probably do it. Because it's how many times are you going to pull up an old like game, watch the full game? You're just going to watch the highlights of the game. And more often than not, you know, if it's. I don't know. It depends on the highlights you're watching. If it's the player's highlights, you're going to see only the good. If you watch the game highlights, you might see a little bit more because it'll be from both sides. You'll see him throw a pick maybe, but. But it's also, if someone was really evil, they could go through and make a, like an, an anti-highlight reel and just all exactly, of his mistakes. Yeah. And then you show that to someone and they'd be like, that's the worst quarterback I've ever seen. Like, that's the thing about yeah. highlights. It's peaks and valleys. You cut out the valleys and just show the peaks. They look awesome. But. And if you just do both then you're just watching film, which is what I think a lot of people want people to do. It's not that. That's just, I, I got to tell you, you one can... of the things that we do for this podcast that I say we, it's more of a me thing, but that, that has helped me a lot is just the second watches of the games when I watch them back on Sunday. Depends after. on the game for me, honestly. <laughs> yeah, they're not so fun when it was like, you know, during the five game losing streak. And I'm like, let's do it again. But it, it is you just it, like a game. And I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm some like I watch film, but it's like watching a game versus watching highlights is like a whole different world. And it's definitely the highlights are just sort of what gets remembered when you're five or 10 years down the line. But that's just sort of the way it is. And I think something that I tried to maybe get across last year and will continue to do a better job of this year, especially for home games, is explain that from my point, what I'm seeing from my point of view in the stadium, because obviously I'm not watching it from the press box or watching it on TV. I didn't see a replay of whatever. Like I'm just watching it from to the stadium and i think people know by now that the post game pods kind of live in their own worlds yeah <laughs> those aren't necessarily i, I mean i hope so what we're gonna hope think so. six months later um, but it's anything like how many people even remember like the 2017 aac championship game right I, I mean everyone talks about that game it was one of the most amazing games ucf has ever played i'm sure you've watched the highlight reels on youtube how many people talk about that milton threw three picks in that game and one of them almost no. cost them the game he threw a pick at midfield at the end of the game almost put was in it? field was goal it? range was it 2017 or 2018 back with during covid i did pull up the full broadcast I remember this because didn't you live tweet it I on Twitter just it. randomly during the <laughs> pandemic? You were like, let's yeah, break that's how out bad it game. was. But um, no, you, it's just that some of the things that you, if you go back and do, you do watch a full game like that. You really see like how many things you forgot about. Like I think in that game, was it was it that game? That might have been 2018 that I was watching. Who even knows at this point? But there was 
one kind of stat, I think it was 2018 because I, I pulled up the like box score and I realized that I think Greg McRae had run for like 200 yards in that game. And I yeah. just didn't even remember that being a thing. Cause it's he a Daryl Mack game. Yeah. It's you remembered Mack had six touchdowns and they they came back and you remember the Otis touchdown and you remember they came back from down at halftime by a lot and ended up winning by, they won by like, was it, what was the score? Was it? it was 18, right? It was like 48. To yeah. 30 they won by, like they won by double digits. I don't it remember. Was... What, it was 56 to 41. That does sound right. Oh, that, yeah, that sounds right. Um, but yeah, that that's I don't remember how we got here. We got to this point, but when we get to, back to back to KJ, when you get to the end of this season and say it is it is so much of it, and it's kind of unfair, I think that well, is it unfair? You'd tell me if it's unfair that at the end of the season, at least for this year, we'll look back on his season largely through the lens of how the team did. Yeah, which is fine. That's always the way it goes, and, and it's it's, 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 the, it's the old he's, adage, he's right? It's the it's like, the, we're talking about the quarterback. It's it's yeah. that's what Scott Frost loved to say, even though it's an old cliche, is that he's going to get too much of the credit and too much of the blame. That's just the way it goes. But let me tell you my new take that I'm dropping right now on how KJ okay. Jefferson will be perceived for his legacy at UCF and for all time, because I've just realized it, and I think this is the actual answer. It's not even going to be how the season plays out. I think it is quite literally going to be the Florida game. Hmm. Because even now with I Mikey think... Keene, what comes up with Mikey Keene? Gator Slayer, one who beat mm-hmm. the Gators. I, I, I think that a, you buy yourself a lot <laughs> of leeway for the rest of That's the so... season if you beat Florida. <laughs> it's dumb and it's also not because of what that win would mean. But I don't know. Like, I, I guess more of it is, say they lose that game and he still like they still have a good season. Say they win, I don't know, they win the Big 12, but they win nine or ten games and they, right. they lost the Florida game. It's like, okay, they still he could still probably look at his legacy as like, but if if they win that game, but still finish like seven and five, eight and four, be like, yeah, but he beat Florida. Like, yeah, they the and, swamp and, beat Florida. And it's not an over exaggeration. Well, it might be, but we're going to say it anyway, because I genuinely believe it. I think that that Florida game, as we get deeper into the offseason and you're thinking more about this upcoming year and where UCF's brand is and where their status is and what comes next. I think that Florida game, there's a case to be made. It's at worst, maybe a top five most important regular season game they've ever played. I have a dumb idea. OK, off of that. Go on. I and this is maybe something we can put out there. Maybe the listeners can tell us if they want this or not. I feel like we should do a standalone podcast like soon about how important that Florida game is. Not preview yeah. the game, obviously, but we've got. I mean, we have months for this post spring, so we absolutely can talk about because and even it's even right now. I want to launch into it, but we're just going to get too far away from KJ because it keeps, again, co- the, it keeps the coming wide up ranging little... implications yeah. of that game. I don't. I don't even know if because obviously fans want to win it, but I, I don't even know if everyone grasps how significant that is. I was telling you, I was listening to the Andy Staples yeah. show today, and they were talking about Florida in 2024, and they went off on this whole like four minute tangent about the importance of that UCF game for Florida and how much Florida must regret, mu- mm-hmm. must regret scheduling it and what's going to happen if they lose it. And it, it's like that game means a lot because look at what happened from beating them in the bowl, which was a yeah. largely an exhibition game where Florida didn't have a head coach. And you're talking about UCF going into the swamp and winning that game, particularly at a time where there's so much up in the air about whether the big 12 and ACC are truly on the same level as the sec and big mm-hmm. 10 is UCF tries to establish itself as a big four member in Florida. There's so much on the line for that game. There's so much on the line. Yeah. And two things about that. So it was, it was that, that you had sent me that clip earlier combined with the fact that I feel like on almost every podcast now we get some kind of into that. We steer into that conversation about how important that game is and how it, Important is like long term, but also just for this season, like the perception yeah. of this season, that it would almost make sense to just do that as and a podcast. And Gus's perception too. We honestly. have a, yeah, we have a lot to get into that, and I don't want to keep like touching on it and then skipping over it because, and we have yeah, we have months of nothing happening, so we might have to do that. I like um, that idea. But the other thing, and I don't know if I want to get into this now, if we're gonna do the podcast on it, but it was on the Andy Staples podcast, the clip that you sent me, um, and this yeah, we can take it back to this because he talked about KJ Jefferson going into the swamp last year and beating Florida with Arkansas. And he's saying this year's UCF team is going to be, he says it's going to be better than that Arkansas team was last year. Yeah. And that even hearing that, I was like, yeah, I don't like it. Didn't, it didn't sound crazy to me. I was like, yeah, actually he's probably right. Which that's the great thing about being in a power four conference is we're at the point where, uh, where uh, a college football personality can comfortably say, yeah, UCF's going to be better than insert sec team here. And it's not <laughs> a crazy statement. It's just like, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah I, I, I do think that I love the idea of doing a podcast on that because I could just launch into a whole thing on that right now. Cool. But I, I do right. think that's going to determine a lot of stuff to wrap up the KJ thing. Mm-hmm. Let's set a bar for what does he stats wise, legacy wise, what does he need to do to be? And I'm, I'm jumping a high bar here, but that we're talking about him like we talk about Milton or Bortles. I'll write it down on this sticky note. What are we going to do? Okay. 
I don't know. You tell me. I, I okay, think well, that it's a high. I, I need I need perspective because I need to go okay. back and see what McKenzie's stats were. Mackenzie in... Milton, his best season in 2017, he had 45 total touchdowns. He had 37 passing touchdowns, eight rushing touchdowns. Um, yeah, he had over 40 40 total touchdowns. 45. I I think that 40. I think that KJ has to break 30 at bare minimum, 30 total touchdowns to to, okay. to to be eligible for that conversation. Okay, and then. That's it. That's the is that the one for Emory you want to put on it? No, I have more. Oh, okay. Like, okay, I wasn't that's sure. It. I was like, yeah, UCF's touchdowns. three and nine, but he had three pa- touchdowns. You paused, so we're like, <laughs> you paused in a way where you were like, "That's it." I was like, "Oh, okay." I thought we was going to write down a whole list here. He's going to need. They're going to need to have at least nine wins. They're going to need to be at least nine and three. My pencil broke. <laughs> oh my god. Nine wins. Okay. They are going to have. This is an or. They are going okay. to have to beat Florida, or win the Big Twelve. Ooh, okay. One of those to, things to has win to the Big Twelve. Yes. Okay. Do we have I mean, any yards? Kind of. I don't think so because I don't think fans care as much about that. Like, I don't either. I, I've seen quarterbacks. Unless who, he runs for a thousand yards. Now maybe. I was gonna say now rushing yards play a role here. Like he, he if he has like if he has like nine hundred rushing yards or like ten rush touchdown, yeah. rushing touchdowns or something. Sure, but I don't know if I want to put that one in. Um, yeah, because I don't know how to like quantify that or like write that in a sentence that fits on a sticky note. The final quantifiable thing is that he's going to need a moment. A moment. That's it. He said, well, it has to be a good one, but you know what I mean? No, he yeah. Needs, no, I know what you mean. He needs Bortles throwing that ridiculous pass against Temple. He needs Milton yeah. flipping through the air against Memphis. You know, that he needs, he, that's what he needs. That's another fun podcast idea. What best individual you see at the, the be, Yeah, the best moments of some of our like. Of, Welcome to the Pegasus favorite. podcast where we just workshop and brainstorm yeah, potential we're just future doing, podcasts. We're just doing admin live on the podcast and people <laughs> are going to be like, that was my favorite thing they said ever because it wasn't analysis. Um, I don't know. Okay, cool. We've got this. I'm going to put this up on. Read it all back to me. Know. I want to make sure it makes sense. Okay, so 30 plus total touchdowns. Okay. Nine wins. Beat Florida or win the Big 12. And then he's need to get, getting to have a moment. Okay, we know. I think we if know what all I'm... of those hit, he is in that. He's in that conversation, right? Probably. Okay. And even if he's not in that conversation, he's probably the first name after right. that top tier. Because who's right after that top tier? It's Dylan Gabriel. I still you, think you Dylan Gabriel is like right it. after the top tier. Like I, I think the top three are the ones I mentioned: Dante, Blake, and McKenzie. But this is always what gets interesting to me. Okay, so you've got that's the group, right? You have McKenzie Milton, For them, Dante Culpepper. Blake yeah. Bortles, those three, then Dylan Gabriel. Who's I think next? so. Who's next? There's such a drop off after that. Who is next? I have no idea. Like I genuinely, I don't even know what name you put there. I, I don't know. I don't even have it. Like I, I, I seriously, I don't even have one for you. I don't know. That's no. that's what I found so interesting about UCF's quarterback history is that the top is so strong, but then there's such a sharp decline from there. Because then you have like some of the guys who like won one conference title each. Yeah, like Kyle Israel. And, Do you just throw him right, in there because he has a conference title? <laughs> Probably not. Know. Justin Holman, like Daryl Mack, who had three starts, but one of them was one of the best individual performances we've seen. Outside I feel like Daryl Mack's the equivalent of like when a, a team has a really highly rated two four seven class because they signed two players, but both of them are five stars. <laughs> like I feel like that's Daryl Mack, right? <laughs> it was that game, just that one game that he Got had three stars, but did quite and a bit I, with them. And I think I I don't know I for some reason have championed myself as like a DJ Mack hype man because yep. I will like I will bring that up anytime any chance I get because that that one performance did cement kind of a unique legacy in UCF football history, but it is interesting because if he, if he does all four of these things, I don't know. I'm, I'm very curious because then if he does these four things that we just mentioned, I am curious if it's going to be, he's the next guy after those top three, he beats out Dylan Gabriel or he is in the top three with like, he, he beca- becomes a four. It becomes a Mount Rushmore of UCF quarterback. It's funny listing it out the way we just did, because I just realized, I think my expectations are for him to, most likely and perhaps almost certainly be a top five quarterback in program history after the season just because the drop off is so severe after those four i feel like even if he just shows up and does exactly what he did at arkansas he's number five i want to i'm trying to which is maybe a lot of disrespect to some of the older ucf quarterbacks but i can't think of any of them who like jump out to me i just pulled up the sent the orlando sentinel in 2021 ranked the top five and i'm like yeah i don't they went Dante the Culpepper, again. Mackenzie okay. Milton, Blake Bortles, Ryan Schneider, Darren Hinshaw. Darren Hinshaw. I don't know. 
which Ryan Schneider yeah. did have a really good season at one point, but I, I yeah. just, I don't know. And I'm looking at this list again. I'm trying to think of like, how could he hit all of these things on the list and like at a bare minimum, like third, just exactly 30 total touchdowns. They win nine games. They beat Florida. And then like, he has a moment. Then you're kind of thinking like, all right, not, I, I, I don't know. That's probably more territory of he's, he's next up after the top three. Right. I don't know. It, it, a lot of it gets kind of almost arbitrary from there. It's like you're, it, it's, it depends on how you look at it, but it's just exciting. Right, I'm after glad we have this in, we have in this the entire list. time that we've had this podcast and we've been doing it. There, it's just been stress with quarterbacks. It, I'm glad that we're having this conversation and not the conversation of what are you showing me the sticky note? Yeah. I'm showing it to the podcast listeners. Okay. That's great. I think they can the hear viewers, us. Talk, that's, the YouTube that's viewers. Too. I mean, <laughs> it's um, a moment you can screenshot that. Yeah, but it's I, I I I'd way rather have this conversation than more conversations of oh god oh no it's JRP again or wow I really hope it's Mikey oh no it's not Mikey or well Dylan Gabriel's yeah. hurt what now I I'm 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 glad to be back with hey they have a good quarterback yeah um all right we'll leave it there it's gonna be interesting it's gonna be a wild I think it's just seasons just gonna set up to be extremely crazy yep um but I'm looking forward to it it's sad that every time we have a conversation about the upcoming season then I'm, I look at the calendar again and I'm like. That we're not oh, even yeah, close. March. I'm like, yeah, we're not even March. close to being close. We're we're no. nowhere close to anything. Certainly not. Um, well, let's move on. We're still in the, in the midst of spring ball, which kind of been like I mentioned earlier, kind of some for some reason a boring spring ball period. But let, we have yeah. a couple of updates. Um, do you want to tell the people about <laughs> the people and me about Kobe Hudson's injury? Because I did not know this was a thing. Yeah, there's not there's not much to this. Gus just mentioned in his press conference this week that Kobe's banged up and he's going to be limited. Gus kind of implied he's going to be limited for the rest of spring, and Gus talked about how it's an opportunity for just shut him down younger guys to step up. That's kind of what I think he was implying. Is I don't it absolutely does not sound like this is some sort of serious injury or something that would even mm-hmm. be on the radar come fall. It's just more you have nothing left to learn from Kobe. I mean, sure, there's building uh, building a connection with KJ, but they have all a fall camp for that, and then they have and they also they that can do that real, on their own. Like, that's one of those things that they could go out to a field on their own in the summer and just do that, you know? Right. Yeah. And like I said, also, let's not forget the season opens up with two practices. They are going to play New Hampshire and then Sam Houston. So they'll be fine. Um, yeah. Why not let the young guys go? So I don't think that's a concern at all. They've it's, I put this out there on Twitter earlier today because you and I have been talking about it and I was felt relieved that a lot of people agreed with me. This has been a very boring spring ball, the most mm-hmm. boring that I can recall covering. And I started covering spring in like 2017 or 2018. It's fun. I, I kind of said it to you earlier when we were talking about this over text. Like, I keep forgetting that it's going on. Yeah. Like, it's just, there's been nothing really has come out of it. And, like, maybe that's a part of it is what we talked about with, like, the lack of question marks around the quarterback position. Because I think a lot of that in the past years has been, like, the talk around spring ball has been quarterback. And if outside of that, it's just like, oh, yeah, there's been a highlight here and there. And I think now it's just kind of been like, yeah, there's been maybe a highlight or here and there, and that's it. I have to say there was an interesting thought that Kyle Nash from Black and Gold Banneret replied to me and pointed out that there's more media access than there ever has been this year. So maybe that's less room for speculation and boredom, but I don't, there has been a lot more media access this year. Media have been allowed to view practices. Players are talking in breakout sessions. It's, it's hallelujah. They're doing that. That's seriously awesome. Um, But I don't totally know if that's it because honestly, you think that that would almost lead to more intrigue, right? Like now that fans are getting some real intel from practices and things like that. And also there hasn't necessarily been, it's just more the the issues themselves. I mean, what's the biggest question mark right now? Is it like who starts at center? Is it, do the linebackers pan out? There's just, there isn't like one really like sexy Mm -hmm. topic to like that, that the whole fan base is going to coalesce around. Like just since we've had this podcast, 2021 was all about Gus Malzahn. New coaching mm-hmm. staff. What's going to happen? Which players are going to stand out? Who isn't? 2022 was the year of toxicity. It was all about JRP versus Mikey, and it was horrible, and we hated every second of it. And last year was Gus Malzahn's giving up the reins of the offense, and can JRP make the leap? And what's a Darren Hinshaw offense look like? Will they will there be vertical passing? Who knows? They haven't brought it up yet. Like and and this year there just isn't something like that. It's you know exactly what you have in KJ. He's a four or five year player in college football. The all the a lot of the key positions are guys we've seen. We know what RJ Harvey is. We know what Kobe Hudson is. We know a lot of what the defensive mm-hmm. guys are. We know what we have in Lee Hunter and Ricky Barber and John Walker. The, and linebackers aren't necessarily the position where the general fan base is going to be like on the edge of their seat to hear a spring mm-hmm. ball update about. So I don't know. It just, it, there Nor isn't are we going to really get topic. any, like you can't really no. get a concrete spring ball update on how the linebackers look because it's just. The absolute you know. most you'd get there is if there are some rumblings or you hear a little bit about who might be rolling with the ones or the twos. And even exactly. that, we can probably connect on our own just given some of I the guys think, they brought in. And I think it's funny because you say that the, the probably the like, I don't even want to call it the main attraction, but like the main point of intrigue, I think, is 
who steps up behind Kobe, right? I don't know, maybe Xavier. And the one little piece of, you know, thing we talked about on the podcast a couple weeks ago, as far as spring ball updates was Bridell Richardson. Right. Like the one, the one topic we've actually kind of had and been like, all right, this is the one guy, like it was a wide receiver. And that's the one topic, like who is, who's it going to be behind those top two receivers that we know about. And that's kind of the point right there is, is a spring ball where your big topic is who will be wide receiver three is not a very interesting spring ball. And, and, and like I said, I don't think anyone is talking enough about the center battle. I don't think we've heard anything mm-hmm. about that yet. And that feels important because it's a three-way oh, battle yeah. right now. They have Jabari Brooks, who they brought in as a transfer. They have Caden Kittler, who filled that role for a bit last year. And they have Walt Claire Flynn, very, very highly rated freshman. So that that's interesting to me. It's just also not something that's going to get decided in spring anyway. So it, exactly. it, it, it's just, I don't know, it's tough. It's, and- it's it seems good, right? Like, it's, I think yeah. this is what a good spring is like when there just really yeah. isn't a lot to talk about. I have two things, actually, now to, to say on, on that, because... One of them is like, I think the perfect spring is probably what we just said, where there's not a lot of like questions like, oh, like you know, even toxicity or just like burning questions. Like we're like, all right, we kind of know what's going on. There's just some pieces to fill in here and here and here. And we'll kind of that will continue into fall. And then I think the perfect spring on top of that ends with getting to watch a spring game. Yes. If you're not <laughs> at the spring game. Like, I yes. think it's like that would be like perfect. I think like most most programs are probably like, They kind of the the diehard fans will always talk about it and, you know, read everything they can and watch everything they can leading up to it. And then if they're not local, they'll watch the game on on TV or on ESPN plus or whatever. And then they'll have coming out of that. They'll have a bunch to talk about. I kind of wonder if not televising it or even streaming it or whatever. And this is probably more of a future question is the people that are there are going to have a lot to talk about. Like you'll see maybe some highlights on Twitter. I don't know what the video is, is like. I don't know what you can and can't do. Um, but only the people that are there watching it live are really going to be able to kind of drive the narratives of what came out of the spring game. And, and we're both going to be there. So yeah. welcome to the podcast so. where we drive the narrative. We're, you, if you're, if you're listening to this and you're not local, you're not going to make it to the spring game. Don't worry. We're going to make up all kinds of crazy things and just to yeah. fit our own narratives. It's going to be and crazy. The, the other thing about maybe like, it's kind of just a theory that I just thought of as to why, like maybe there's not as much buzz around it is, if people have, and I'm just going to sound bad, but if people have like UCF fatigue, just because the basketball season meant more this year. And so people were like kind of channeling their interest toward UCF basketball. And then there was like football, spring football kind of started. And people were like, oh yeah, like, cool. Spring football started, but like, we're still focusing on basketball. Now basketball's over, but the interest in basketball went deeper. It felt like this year and was more sustained and just more intense. And now that's over. It's kind of like, all right, we'll, we'll see y'all for, actual football season i I had not thought a ton about that and i think you absolutely just hit the nail on the head for a big part (laughs) of it is i do think it's basketball right because we Mm -hmm. have never literally other than the tournament season i can't recall a time that the interest was this high in the basketball program and not just in ucf basketball itself but ucf fans caring about the basketball conference they are in and interacting with other fan bases and caring about things like the big 12 tournament that did cover up a lot of it you're actually you're actually absolutely right because as long as we've had this podcast and i had not thought about this spring ball was always more important than the end of men's basketball season. That was always story number one. And that was not the case this year at all. So that is interesting. I think that's a huge part of it. Maybe everyone cares now. Maybe this week it's going to be, you know, which it is a combination. Cause like I said, at the same time, there just isn't some major storyline to cover, right? you know? So I think it's a combination of those things, but that'll be interesting to monitor in the years going forward. If, because, and we've talked about a lot, this is the most I've ever paid attention to a college basketball season as a whole, not just a specifically Mm -hmm. UCF season because UCF was part of, you know, the big time part of that sport. They were playing all of the top teams. They were in the best conference in the country. It just, it, 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 you're way more engaged than when you're like, like when UCF and Tulane would play a men's basketball game, the only two people or the only two groups of people on the planet who care are UCF fans and Tulane fans. Mm-hmm. Wasn't the case for a lot of UCF season this year that they were in the national <laughs> spotlight a lot. So I thought you were going to say the only two people watching UCF and Tulane were me and you. <laughs> it, listen, I, I remember, yeah, um, there was a time where, I mean, I mean, I actually would be curious to see like, and there's no way to get this information, but the ESPN plus data for a late season UCF Tulsa game in 2022 versus, I don't know, uh, the UCF TCU game this past year. I I just, Mm -hmm. the difference must be astounding, you know? Yeah. Um, It's just a shame after all that, they didn't get an NIT game to play. Yeah. Um, Too bad that they missed out on the NIT, but uh, uh, you know, are we talking about, I I, I don't have to do a whole thing on it, but Johnny Dawkins is apparently getting extended. That I was going to, I was um, going to include that night. at the end of the football news, even though it's not football news. I was just going to throw in a piece of bonus news, but we can talk about it real quick now if we want. 
We, um, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think we're done with the spring ball talk. I don't know what else. I, yeah, the, only I, other, I, the only other major update is that they're having their first scrimmage. I believe it's their mm. first scrimmage this weekend. So we'll, we will finally get a little bit of intel, hopefully, out of that as far as maybe who's stacking up where the depth chart. But that's kind of We'll it. get that. I think we'll get intel. And I think with a scrimmage, there's more chance for like UCS content team to like get some actual highlights. So like, I think right. maybe we'll Which see. Which they've been posting some good highlights. That yeah. that KJ throw they posted, I think, today was really a really, really, really cool throw. So I've not seen it. So, okay, well. You should look it up. It's nice. Um, but yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, Johnny Dawkins um, offered a contract extension. I guess they're finally finalizing details still. Yeah. I'm still um, like in the phase of I'm holding my breath until it's officially announced, even though the Orlando Sentinel and everyone else has reported that it's happening. But John Rothstein. I'll reserve my victory lap until it's official and then we can really yeah. go in. But I, I don't want to rehash. If you listen to our episode, you know where we stand on this on the right side of history was that it always made sense to extend Johnny Dawkins. I, I, I The USF loss sucked, and I'm still very upset about it, and I'm not going to get over loss? it. it Bailey's so upset about it, he continues to pretend he, it doesn't exist. And I want to be clear that this isn't a podcast thing. He acts like this in real life, too. We have not spoken about that game. But it was awful, and I'm mad about it. I think that if you want a coach fired over one game, you're nuts. I think that UCF is not even sort of that type of program. And I just think that a lot of fans really – just have a dramatic misunderstanding of the reality of the basketball program and have a really mm -hmm. dramatic misunderstanding of what a remarkable UCF men's basketball, having a winning record in year one in the big 12 and UCF football, not is something that is insane to me. And I don't think people are even sort of understand how incredible what basketball did was. And I, the idea of moving on from Dawkins after that, particularly because it's, I, I, I could maybe be singing a different tune if this had been some one-off year or some things broke their way. They were competitive in every game and there's a roadmap now. They have mm -hmm. Mikey Williams coming in. They have two other blue chippers from high school coming in. Like there's a roadmap here the to kingdom, them actually being competitive in this conference. And the kingdom just said that they got what two of their biggest, the, it was weird the way they worded it. Cause I don't know if it was two of the kingdom's biggest um, donations or if it was the two biggest donations to the kingdom that were tailored or that were specifically for men's basketball. Right. They said they, they got were both six donations. figure donations and they both came right. in this week. So like basketball is rocking and rolling right now that yeah. with the fan support and everything, this would have been such a weird time to make a coaching change. It just mm -hmm. would have defied logic. So can I'm, I I'm read, thrilled. can I read the tweet that I sent you that said it was an incredible summary of why Dawkins should be back? Or is that not appropriate for the podcast? You do you. Okay. Um, this was from the Twitter account says memory champion. And this was a reply to our friend JP Gilbert and says, given the freaks and perverts in college sports, I'm fine re-upping seemingly a solid dude coming off a season or coming off a solid year at a school with zero history of sustained success in the sport. And I think that is such a good summary of it. And people are going to hate that because they're like, oh, you're settling for mediocrity. But I, I just don't. I think that's a really good way of putting it. Like, I, I think that this, the settling for mediocrity people always make me laugh because it's like you look at the history of UCF basketball and it hasn't been so much mediocrity. It's just being flat out bad. Mm -hmm. And then they went to the best league in America and were competitive in almost every game. And we're like, time to fire the coach. I'm not saying one tournament appearance in eight years is ideal. It's not. I wish they would have made it more. I suspect they're not going to go another eight years without making it. I think mm -hmm. that in this conference, if they get the talent in, they can be just a solid team and make it in there. And then the, the great thing about the tournament is it's not even like, it's not like football where the goal for men's basketball is we have to build to the point that we're winning the conference or it's a failure. You've seen this a million years, whether it's Oakland this year or FAU last year, whoever it's like you make the tournament and anything can happen as long as they get to the mm -hmm. point where they can make it once every few years, which is very attainable. That's it. That's great. Yeah. And, and they can make stuff happen from there. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. I think we can leave the basketball stuff there. Let I'm me say one more with... thing about that okay. tweet that I also enjoyed was it was particularly on point given that the one big candidate rumored for UCF was a guy who was literally fired a year ago for, I think, his second DUI. So, yeah, yeah on point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> crazy. All right, get into the football news now. And this is actually another piece of bonus, you know, spring ball talk is that Knights versus Knots is returning for another year. And I almost want to say that fed into what we just talked about. I was like, I don't think there was a big reaction to that. No. Well, it it's also just because like they're, it's, they've they done it before. Year. It's, it's yeah. not the same. There was a lot of hype around it last year just because, exactly. oh my God. But I'm, I don't know. I don't know how they can ever go away from that now. It's just too perfect. Right. I think it's perfect, but it's like they announced, like, oh yeah, Knights versus, versus Knots is back. And everyone's like, okay, cool. The other thing missing from this <laughs> year is I, I totally forgot when I was thinking of all the intrigue from last year was there were two other big ones on top of Gus giving up play calling and what's happening with JRP. There was, they were moving to the Big 12. Mm -hmm. And there was also JRP trying to do baseball at the same time. And that oh, yeah. with him running from the baseball stadium to the football <laughs> stadium and running out on the field. Yeah. So Knights versus Knots, April 12th. That's not next Friday. So two, two weeks from this Friday. That's very exciting. Very, very exciting. Missed it last um, year. So thrilled to be there this yeah. year. 
speaking of things I missed, this was something I missed last week, and I don't have to read all this because this is a lot now that I look at the the outline. But there's some some jersey number updates. Brandon Adams is now wearing number zero. It's a pretty cool one. Yep. Randy Pittman's wearing number five. I didn't even know Derek LeBlanc because he didn't play last year, wasn't eligible. He was number 90 last year. Now he's number 88. Um, Hope fans will be able to get used to that one. Brunel Richardson, who apparently is going to be maybe UCS wide receiver three or two, uh, was is going to be number eight. Riley Trujillo, 17. That's fun. And then transfer jersey numbers. KJ is obviously number one. They've got Byron Threats at number 12. Ladarius Tennyson, 13. Miles Montgomery wearing 22, which is my favorite number. Nice. And Goldie Lawrence wearing 85. So that, I just gave you some of the highlights because I wrote out all of the ones that I thought were originally highlights. Then I realized it's it a was long list. Be UCF survey, stadium survey part two. Um, so avoiding that. Last piece of news. This is actually pretty big news. Uh, UCF is a quote major player for Coco wide receiver Javon Boggs, who is a blue chip wide receiver, recently decommitted from Ohio State. Uh, he was committed to them since like October, I think. That's Brandon Helwig was reporting that um on wednesday so we'll see if there's any movement on that coming up soon but i would like a blue chip wide receiver yeah i feel like on top of that first off let me just say how hilarious it is that we're in the era where a player a very highly rated player this is a top 200 player is committed to ohio state and then decommits and everyone's like ah yeah might be might be ucf is the reason that's (laughs) happening um i also have to point out that steven leonard reported that Javon Boggs uh, decommitted from ohio state after visiting ucf he was on campus and then decommitted that night so uh interesting interesting for sure that's very, very yeah notable. that is a completely like very pertinent wrinkle that i didn't know about like that's that's good that's i just, checked that's out so ohio state's message boards and they weren't too thrilled <laughs> about, they weren't. about let's let's also point out this is tears removed from ohio state losing out on john walker to ucf like we live in a reality where ucf may be about to once again take <laughs> a major player away from ohio state which is just one of those things that makes me smile and giggle a little bit because i can't believe it's real life Oh, it's so great. It's like, I love this timeline that we're in as far as recruiting and all just the interest and all that. And like, I just really am ready for it to translate to the field. And that's why I feel like the season is so important. Listen, it has in that the players they're recruiting are playing and doing well. It just, yeah. it, 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 like, it's not like something where they get all these big guys and then they just miss on them. Like John Walker was right. a freshman All-American. Braden Marshall was out there a ton. The third one was out there too. Randy Pittman, that's the one. Oh. I knew there was another one. I forgot for a second. Like they're hitting on these guys, and it's the as they one. get older. <laughs> Nakai Martinez has turned into an amazing player. Damari Henderson's turned into an amazing. Like the, <laughs> those guys are both set up for huge years this year. So like it's working. It's just yeah. I feel like in the immediate gratification of the transfer portal era, you, people have forgotten that with like the high school players, it actually takes a couple of years before right. they're ready to be amazing. So it is working. Yeah, it is. Um, move on. Game of the week. It's UCF baseball has a three game series. Um, against Texas Tech, UCF sixteen and six overall, four and five in the Big Twelve. Texas Tech eighteen and seven, four and five in the Big Twelve. They play Thursday at six, Friday at six, and Saturday at one. Um, starts the day earlier because of the Easter holiday on Sunday. The Big Twelve baseball standings right now are just a jumbled mess, which is like I think you, Big Twelve standings in every sport. Because yeah, I think that's you've pretty, got. Uh for the course in terms of big 12 records you've got kansas state at the top at five and one then you have oklahoma at seven and two but after that it's texas and west virginia are four and two oklahoma state and cincinnati are three and three and three and three i don't know why i said that twice um and then you've got ucf and texas tech actually you have four teams at four and five and they've played an extra series than those two three and three teams have and so it's just this every weekend i guess at this point is going to feel like a chance to make some movements so like yeah. ucf wins this series they'll be They'll move up a few spots and Texas Tech's in the same spot. So it's interesting. It's really interesting. It's nice. This is the latest they've gone into a season without collapsing because they they were really good (laughs) at the hot starts under Love Lady. So, yeah, Um, they've won two two consecutive um, series, actually, on on the weekend series. They they got swept by Oklahoma, which it's still disappointing that that they got to let that first game get away, because even if they had won that game, like they lose two out of three there. Fine. Then they got to win. And they'd be five and four right now. And they've won, I think it was Kansas and I don't forget, Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State, I think they beat in the, uh, two out of three. Um, and then Kansas, they beat this past weekend two out of three by sweeping a doubleheader on Saturday. Doubleheaders are tough to sweep, too. So they're also winning all the midweek games, including against yeah. FAU, who I think is actually kind of okay at baseball. Yeah. So. Um, they beat FAU. They almost had a no hitter on. Um, on Tuesday, Jacksonville. I think they, yeah, they got uh, Jacksonville. I think they got to one out away from a no hitter. The first one since like the seventies, but yeah, it's been fun. Um, hope it continues to stay fun. Having a good and time. If, they, it if has... they can kind of get into the the realm where they're like on the, the bubble of the tournament, then it'll get even more fun. And then that's it'd be nice to see them make the tournament for the first time since 
2017 it would be so me sort of due to really just being more uninformed than anything wanting love lady gone and then also thinking hiring Girardi would be stupid and that then resulting in baseball being really good has inflated my ego in ways you cannot even comprehend <laughs> um, i'm ready to start just launching takes at this point <laughs> I just hope it's sustained. I mean, it is. It's still early in the yeah. conference season because it's, I think it's they do play what is it eighteen conference games? So I think they're actually exactly half. No, they can't be halfway through the conference. There's no already. way they play eighteen. There's no way they might play way more than that because the season goes into May. So yeah, I, yeah, I think I'm wrong on that. But they are. They're three series in, and hopefully they can get another series win. That's just the key to everything in baseball is win two out of three, and you're going to keep doing. You know, you're yeah. anywhere you need to be. So. That's it. Just keep winning series. I hope that's what they do. Um, tweet of the week. Tweet of the week. Doing something a little different this week. We're going to swap oh, out okay. Tweet of the Week for Dream of the Week. That's right, everybody. We're going to dive deeper into Bailey and I's subconsciouses. So I, it, you know, normal thing, texted Bailey because I thought it was funny that I had a dream last night related to UCF football. So I texted Bailey and told him. And the dream was crazy. I know. I had a dream that Colton Boomer lost to UCF a game this year. Like, I, I don't fully remember that. It was one of those things where I wake up and I, I don't remember all the details. It was just they mm-hmm. lost and it was because he missed a kick or something. And I was really upset. I think they might have been playing Missouri, which does not make sense. But anyway, I, I texted you that. And it was actually almost like, because it, it was like my brain reminding me, don't forget, there's also a kicker issue that needs to be discussed at some point. Oh, yeah. I figured Bailey would be like, oh, ha, ha, how funny you have UCF on your mind. <laughs> That's not what Bailey replied with. Bailey replied to let me know that he also had a UCF dream last night. And that it, I, I'm just going to read you the exact text Bailey sent me today because I couldn't stop laughing after getting it. So this is Bailey. I had a dream last night that I was in a parking garage on campus and I saw some guys getting into a car and one of them was Johnny Dawkins. He got into this car in the most absurd way imaginable. Like his head was down below the driver's seat and he had his legs up in the air and onto the back seat. So I was like, WTF. Somehow I then ended up in this car without them knowing who I was or questioning why I was there. And Dawkins was suddenly in the middle of the front seat. And I hear a guy in the passenger seat say something like, you'll want to reach out to them. They'll have the same email format as us, just with South Carolina at the end instead of UCF. So I texted you, like, I think Dawkins is going to South Carolina. And all the while, I was trying to figure out how I could get out of the car at a reasonable stop before they got too far from campus because they were headed for the airport. And for some reason, I lived somewhere off campus with you. I am fascinated by the way your mind works because I I love so many different things about this. I I love that D- Johnny Dawkins is going to South Carolina. I love that the re- the way that you would find this out as the imposter in this car is because they're telling him to change an email template to South Carolina. I also love that you had this dream after the news came out that Johnny Dawkins was not leaving UCF. <laughs> I guess I guess I subconsciously was just like still worried about like this still stress. I, yeah. I don't know. It was very, it was very insane. I, and it's crazy. Cause like, I will have random weird dreams like that sometimes. And not nah, I'm going to say they're all that weird. Cause then people are just gonna be like, that's what's wrong with you. But I don't remember like all the details. This is the most, like most details of a dream. I feel like I've remembered in a while. That's why I, I was fascinated. Why. It was like, you were telling me a whole story and I was just, I was, so, I was so just, it was vivid. This whole thing. Like I know yeah, exactly I can tell. we were, we were like, I know exactly where it's weird because the whole parking garage on campus. And then I remember when we were driving and I was like trying to figure out where to get out. It was like we were still we were kind of off campus at that point. We were off campus in a spot where it wouldn't have made sense to have like gotten on in the car on campus and then been in this spot. But we were like heading, I don't know if it's south, heading down McCulloch, which is like off the side of the, the that street where, you know, we used to live off of at Tivoli and like by the football stadium. Right. It's like we're on this street headed down. And I'm like, all right, like the next time I get to the stop, do I just like because they, they didn't somehow like it was like it was in Harry Potter where I was wearing like an invisibility cloak. Like they didn't know I was in there. <laughs> That's great. But I was in there and I was waiting for us to stop. I was I was waiting for the car to stop so that I could like, but I'm like, like okay, well, how can I get out? Because like, if the door just opens, they're going to wire the door open and they're not going to, I don't know, it was weird. I was invisible for some reason. So you were straight up in a Harry all. Potter storyline. Like, like it wasn't just like, you, like you were in the car. They don't know you're there and you have to find a way to get out of the car without them knowing that, that you have escaped. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Because I'm like, well, how does the car like open for me to get out? Because then I, otherwise I was like, well. I was still far. I don't know. And the other thing was like weird because like, this is not my living situation. Like you and I do not live together off campus. Nope. So haven't in many years. I, I, yeah, it has not happened in many years. And for me, it was like, all right, well, I need to get out here. Like I'm still too far to walk back to my, you know, back to where I live, but I can at least like, get an Uber and like not be invisible and get to my apartment now. And before I get all the way to the airport and then get out of the car and then have to Uber from the airport, it was stupid. See, but this is was... what I love about dreams 
and why they're always so hilarious to me is because in the dream, you being invisible in a car with Johnny Dawkins is no issue at all. But like the concept of getting home still has to follow real world <laughs> rules. Like you're like, I have to actually get a car and then I'm gonna have to Uber home since I'm not like that all is still logical, but it's just, it's very funny. The it's other like, part I want to go to, dream. the other detail I want to go back to is like, I'm trying to, I don't think I did a good job of explaining how Johnny Dawkins, but how I first <laughs> noticed that Johnny Dawkins was in this car. Like he was upside down in the back seat. His back was like on the floorboards and his head was like almost under the under the seat in front of him. And then his legs were like up and he was like it was like it was a beetle on his back in the back seat. <laughs> Normal of the car. way to sit, yeah. And and it was so weird. And then the next thing I know, I'm in the car and he's just in the front seat, which was like, you know, I don't know if the older cars were like this, I think, where it was like a three like a three seater in the front. It was kind of like a more of like a bench style seating in the front seat. And he was in the middle. Then there's and the guy, the thing I didn't tell you is like the guy who said the thing about the email, I don't think he worked at UCF. I think he was like more, he was a reporter and he had sure. a name like in the, in the dream. I don't remember his name, but in the dream, I texted you. Like, I was like, yeah, this guy, I was like, do you know who this, this reporter is? Can you look him up? Cause he's the one who said it. So I was like, he knows something. And now we know it something. had to be Rothstein. I just, I want no, to picture it though. Rothstein. <laughs> it wasn't, if it was John Rothstein, I feel like I could have, you know, escaped from my, invisibility cloak and, and it would have been normal because John Rossi would have been like oh and he would have said some saying but like I don't know it it was a bizarre dream but I honestly I will see what people think about this dream I don't know if there's any dream analysts out there some people but... are there's a good chance because some people are really into that stuff so there we might have a listener who's really into the dream stuff and is going to tell you what whatever this means it, it, yeah. it, it could be great who knows and if, if I don't know I, I feel like I we I don't know I feel like I have UCF related dreams often enough to where anytime I do, I could just bring it up on the podcast. If I have the one, which it actually maybe doesn't New say segment about dream me, of the it, week. It, it's not an unusual thing for me to have a UCF related dream. Can I mention my other one? I think I should. My, my one from like last year. I don't remember. Before it, John, but okay. About John Walker, the one I told you about earlier. Oh yeah. Yeah. When John yeah. Walker before, I think it was after John Walker committed before he had even gotten to UCF, I had a random dream Never met John Walker in my life. Had a random dream that I was like somehow like best friends with John Walker to the point where like he had me like had like a VIP lanyard like in the locker room after a game. They had lost the game and like he was really down about it. And I was like consoling John Walker about like I was like, all right, man, like you I was like, you played really, really well. And like I was like that, like you're a freshman, dude. And it was like we were friends. Like it was so weird that I was there and that was a real dream that I had. So deal with that yeah. one, dream analysts. I need to get you to a press conference just so you can Ask John Walker and be like, John Walker, or I guess you would call him John Walker if you were talking to this topic. Hey, but I don't know. If just calling him John seems odd to me. He just, he is John Walker. But if you were just like, John, um, I had a dream about you last year that we were best friends. Um, Care to comment? <laughs> it's going to be bad because like, uh, I don't know. If I'm ever in the, in the situation, like if we go to the spring game and I'm covering the spring game and like they bring in John Walker to talk after the game, you're going to look at yeah, me. Maybe don't go, though. Maybe don't actually. Oh, I'm not going to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. Good. If it was ever a thing where I actually met him and like we did have established a kind of like, oh yeah, like hey, what's up? And we were oh, having poor. just a random conversation. I'd be like, you know what's weird? <laughs> I would just tell him. That. I feel like, I like there's no good way to tell someone you've dreamt about them. I just don't think there's any solid way to you give a person to that information. Lay it on pretty thick before you even mention it. It's like, yeah. Now listen, this was a very normal occurrence, a normal situation. But you were in a dream that I had. Like it's better to say, like I didn't. I had There's, a dream about you. It sounds sad. bad. No, however, you're it's saying. bad. It's bad if you tell someone like I had a dream about you or I dreamt about you. It's you say like, oh, I had this dream and you were there. Like that's not as bad. Yeah, but then, but think. then you're gonna keep talking and explain that he was the centerpiece of the dream. Like it's <laughs> he wasn't really there. He was the reason for the dream. But yeah, I don't know what that was about. But probably just excited. Was... That was right. I think you had that dream shortly after he signed or something. Like it was around that so. time. Yeah. Yeah. Dream of the week. Dream of the new, week. New peak inside of my brain, apparently. And <laughs> hopefully I'm not, not sure a continuing segment, but I, I um, love that too much to not repeat. So thank you for okay. sharing your dream of the world. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. We will uh we'll get out of here now before I, you know, remember any other dreams that I've had about UCX. I'm sure there have been more. Oh yeah. Um we'll be back next week with episode 199. We're closing on 200, getting almost there. Um, back with episode 199 next week. But until then, you can find us on Twitter at Bailey J Adams 22 at by CA Simmons at night sports now and at Pegasus podcast. Thank you guys so much for being with us and we will talk to you next week. Bye everybody.